The scripture reading today is from Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Don't be in debt to anyone except for the obligation to love each other. Whoever loves another person has fulfilled the law. The commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't desire what others have, and any of the other commandments are all summed up in one word. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Love doesn't do anything wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is what fulfills the law. Please remember this. Amen. Well, that's a pretty straightforward little message from Scripture, isn't it? Just uh, doesn't need a lot of explanation, but there's, there's some wonderful ways that Paul is expressing the significance of that passage that, that ought to connect for us. At least they do for me. I hate being in debt. How about you? I don't like accumulating debt. We were just looking the other day at how far we still have to pay on the automobile we own. I don't like those payments. Uh, I don't like being in debt. But we live in a culture that, that uses debt all the time. Right? We are always, uh, we tend to be people in debt. I remember when our kids were going off to college and we started getting credit card offers for our kids. And I thought, why? Why are they praying? I mean, not praying, but <laughs> praying on our kids already. They're going to college where they're going to get into enormous debt, and now they want to offer them credit cards when they have no jobs. And they're going to get more in debt if they use those cards. It's, it's just the way that we have cultivated life here in the U.S. We were in debt for lots of things, aren't we? Usually we are in debt for a long time if we own a home or uh, make, a lot of people are in debt because they do have credit cards or we may be in debt because of the high cost of medical care. Uh, we, we may be paying on, on things that are meant to be just for survival. Right? Um, maybe you're in debt these days because of the cost of groceries. Some people are using their credit cards to buy food. Um, debt is a part of our life and, and uh, the scripture has some interesting words about debt interesting ideas the Jewish people did not believe that well technically they did not believe that you should ever charge interest for a loan that isn't the way it always got practiced right but that was a commandment of the scripture that you would not that you would not charge interest on loans. So the whole banking interest industry is un, under question now. Uh, usury was the term for it, and it was seen as evil. And if you think about it, you can see why, right? Being in debt and and the, interest that can be charged. I mean, the percentage rates on our credit cards are outrageous, aren't they? 19%, 20% interest. Um, and you never get out of debt. Usury was seen as a, as a means of keeping people in poverty. And so it was evil. It was a, a way of, of holding people in debt. In fact, it wasn't just a commandment against that kind of debt. It wasn't a commandment not to lend things to people, or to even lend money, but not to collect interest on it. But there were th other ways that the scripture also speaks about debt, that, that reveals a whole different perspective than our, our way of living in the world today. And that is that every seven years, debts were to be forgiven. How about that? Good. Every seven years. And after 50 years, the year of Jubilee, all uh, indebtedness that entailed your properties were to be returned to you. All the, the land that was in your family name was to be returned. Now that's not the way 
people practiced it very well. Didn't end up working out necessarily as intended, but the idea is embedded in the scripture that people would not remain in debt indefinitely or permanently. It was a way of preventing multi-generational poverty. It was a way of ensuring that people didn't fall into a spiraling cycle of, of endless poverty. Isn't that a great way to look at it? We live in such a complex economic global situation these days that the, those scripture uh, mandates may seem impossible. But the principle of the idea of it should still impact our lives and our understanding and the way that we treat people. Paul is saying not to be in debt. I like the way he's using that uh, image because we can understand the heavy burden of debt. Right? We can understand how, how uh, <clears throat> it weighs on people's lives. Not to be in debt to anyone except for one thing. And to always be in debt. To be perpetually in debt for one thing. And that is to love one another. That changes your perspective too. He's turning around this whole concept of economic debt that is prohibited in Scripture. And now he's imposing a debt on us. A debt of love for one another. And that should not be the same sense of, of heaviness, but of, of joy and thanksgiving. Although you might find it difficult. You mean I've got to love everyone? I'm indebted, I'm obligated now to love everyone. But there's people I don't like. There's people I don't want to love. And Paul is saying, yes, you are indebted. But I think that that very idea can help us with, the, with those that we find difficult to love. If we think of it in terms of, well, God has called me. I am actually indebted. I am obligated to love you. We tend to think of love in simply sentimental terms in our culture, don't we? We, we talk about love as falling in love, and it's all about emotion. It's all about... Uh, the way we feel and, and sense things. But love is never, in Paul's writing, love is never mere sentiment. It's not about how you feel about someone. It's not, when Paul says that we are obligated to love someone, that doesn't mean Paul thinks, oh, you're going to have warm, fuzzy feelings about them. What Paul means is what he says in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the greatest definition I have read, uh, and I read it regularly, of love. I haven't found nothing that improves on, on Paul's ancient words in chapter 13, where he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. See, that's what Paul is talking about when he says that we should owe this one debt. If you want to fill in the blank, what does that love mean? It doesn't mean warm, fuzzy feelings, although you may have those. And you may grow to have those as you begin to actually practice love in the way that Paul defines it. As you begin to practice love, you may suddenly feel yourself feeling less irritated by the people who irritate you. You may find yourself actually deciding they're not so bad after all. They've got some good qualities that I hadn't noticed. You may find that that's changing your attitude and your view toward other people. But it's not principally or primarily 
certainly not first, all about warm, fuzzy feelings. I mean, think about life in the ancient world. That's not why people got married, even. People didn't get married because they had fallen in love and they had this deep uh, emotional uh, attraction to someone. Their parents arranged it a long time before that. Their parents arranged marriage for their children. And that's just the way it was. And they may have had a really good marriage as a result. We tend to think that you have to fall in love first. Fall in love. But you fall out of love just as easily as you fall into love. Maybe easier. Because once you start living together and you're there and you're together with one another all the time, you're going to be irritated. You're going to be noticing all the things that bother you. And you may find yourself falling out of love a lot faster than you fell in love. But if love is not about those warm, sentimental, feely uh, things, it's about what Paul is describing. And you grow into love. Can I say, it doesn't matter if your marriage is arranged or you choose the person that you love. You can love someone deeply and truly and fully. There are cultures still today where marriage is arranged. And I think statistically, it doesn't matter if you're in a culture like that or in a culture like ours, the divorce rate is similar. Culturally, uh, we have a view that, that has false expectations. Right? We have this view that we've fallen in love and nothing could ever break it. And every couple that comes to me for marriage premarital counseling before they get married, they have this view that no one has ever loved like we love. No one has ever had the feelings that we have for one another. But yes, they have. Indeed, everybody has had those feelings. But what they haven't learned yet is what love really means, what love looks like in a practical terms. And that is what Paul is talking about, that kind of love. I would encourage you to read chapter 13. You could read it every single day and, and meditate on those words that Paul speaks about because it is a challenge to our culture. It is a, it is a profound a way of living in the world. And Paul calls us now to put that into practice in debt to one another. I am in debt to love everyone I meet. Everyone I meet. That's basically what Paul is saying. It is to be kind and to be patient and not to let irritability uh, destroy my attitude toward others. It is, it is to love justice and truth. And there's... There's such a profound way of interacting with other people if we make love the principle. Right? E. Stanley Jones, uh, I've quoted before, but he was a great um, missionary to India. And he, he's written a lot of devotional books. He, from the early part of the 20th century, he was good friends with uh, Gandhi. And... Uh, he, he writes some very simple admonitions for us and this, uh, this is Christian maturity. But he, he speaks about love as something that disarms. And <clears throat> he writes this about a pastor who was giving a young alcoholic a good scolding. A pastor, you know, he was explaining the evils of alcoholism and scolding this young man uh, who richly deserved it. And the young man sat with his head down and did not say a word. He knew he deserved everything that was being said. He had no defense. And yet, 
He was really unmoved by the pastor. The pastor's scolding had no effect. Even though he knew he deserved it, even though he knew he was guilty of everything that the pastor was saying to him, and the pastor was right, it did not move him. It did not have the power to change him. Until his mother came over to him and planted a kiss on his bloated lips, that changed him. He could not withstand this silent, suffering love. What a moral lecture could not do, love did. A woman stopped an alcoholic in his car and said that she wanted to talk with him. What do you want to do, scold me? No, replied the woman, I want to love you. And her love pulled him out of his alcoholism. An article in the newspaper tells of the comparative failure of psychiatry to redeem alcoholics. Why? Its method is largely based on knowledge, on knowledge instead of love, and nothing can succeed without love. Everything, however well contrived, fails without love. E. Stanley Jones writes. And then he prays, O oh God, my gracious Father, I want to think love, feel love, act love, and be love. Then I shall be, in some faint way, like thee. Kindle all my feeble loves into flame. Make me a fire with love. Amen. Amen.